fiction, science fiction, horror, fantasy, crime, LGBT, thriller. You have now entered the house of mystery with your hosts, Eric Shapiro, David North Martino. John Copenhaver and Al Warren. Heard on KCP 106.5 FM Los Angeles. 102.3 FM Riverside. And 105.0 AM Palm Springs. Uh, joining us, we've got Matthew Swain. Um, thank you for being here, Matt. Thank you very much for having me on. Ah, this is going to be fun. Now, you've written some great books. I was looking through, and you, there's quite a bit I could talk to you about. I mean, we, mm -hmm. could, we could get into the uh, ghosts of Penn State. Uh, we already did before. Um, mm -hmm. You know, uh, America's Haunted Universities. Uh, the Haunted Rock and Roll thing, too. Um, that would be interesting, too. There's so, there's so many different stories out there. Um, but I chose your latest book, um, Haunted World War Two. Woohoo! Um, now, what? First of all, when you when you started writing Haunted World War Two, um, what what did you what did you have to do differently? That's a really good question, and I can give you the brief uh, overview of my career. And it starts at birth. I was born on Halloween. So, so I, I started writing, I didn't really start writing about the paranormal, but I was always interested in ghost stories and folklore. I, I can't remember a time of not being interested in that. And what happened to me is when I started working as a reporter for a local newspaper in Pennsylvania, I started to always try to come up with a really good Halloween feature story. So I came up with, uh, an idea one year to do some local ghost legends. And I ended up adding some ghost stories from Penn state because it's pretty close by my hometown. And I never really got a reaction to a story like I got from that one. Uh, people were coming up, you know, on the street at restaurants at bars telling me their ghost stories. And, you know, there was a, a part of me that thought this is a really good idea. If I could make it into a book, that's, that got me into um, talking about university ghost lore and ghost stories. But, but from there, I started trying to, I, you know, I, I landed my first book contract. And from there, I tried to mix my uh, love of certain eras of history with the, the supernatural. So that kind of led to this haunted rock and roll. And I did a book called even more haunted rock and roll and, and ghosts of country music. And I was looking for a project. And honestly, I, I'm a kind of more of a civil war nerd than anything. And so I wanted to do a ghost of civil uh, ghost stories of the civil war. But what I found is that there's just really so many people have covered that and have done a really good job that I didn't feel like I could add anything to it. So I switched gears and I, I do like world war II history I started delving into that and, you know, very quickly I found uh, the difference between this book and the other books is, you know, Haunted Rock and Roll, I could write a lot of tongue-in-cheek ghost stories of Jim Morrison haunting a bathroom of a Mexican restaurant. You know, I could do some Elvis Presley ghost stories that are more, you know, ghost lore. But with this, the, the material was was much more serious. I mean, when you're talking about the sacrifices of, of not only the soldiers, but also a lot of the civilians, it adds a little bit of um, a more of a somber tone. And as a writer, I don't want to get into areas where I, I think I might offend people. Uh, I intention one of the, the things that came out of my research, especially talking to a uh, a ghost hunter who uh, lives in, in Germany is he told me the, the concentration camps and those sites are extremely haunted, 
but he refuses to uh, research in those areas. And he really convinced me to stay away from that. And so those are some of the things that I had to think about when I was writing this that I, I never had to uh, when I was working on, especially the, the music ghost book, because there are serious topics that I bring up in the, the music ghost book, uh, but not, not anywhere close to what I worked here. Yeah. And musicians aren't as offended so easily. Yeah. They're, they're great about that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and you, when you come to death or concentration camps and things like that, there's, it's still very painful for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. So, you know, yeah. And the, the added twist to that is it's very painful for people. I really believe that there's a connection between consciousness and, and some of these stories that events in, in the case of haunted rock and roll, I really found a connection between the consciousness raising activity of music, what it does to a person's being and their perceptions and maybe even their acceptance of the supernatural in these books, too, the idea of trauma, the idea of sadness, of, of lives lost so quickly, I think play a role in that consciousness supernatural connection. So on one hand, you have an area that is bring to the, I believe my book probably only scratches the surface of the, the supernatural stories out there. But you have so many, but then you have to be very delicate in how you deliver them. Now, now in Haunted World War II, what was the premise? Like, where, where were you selecting to go? Kind of, what, what was the outline of what that book was going to be? Yeah, so as soon as I started to research the, the ghost stories, I quickly found that the difference between, let's say, the, the ghost stories that I love about the Civil War and the ghost stories of World War II is that World War II is a global conflict. And not only is it global in the sense that it was international, but it was also three-dimensional. There were, uh, you know, airplanes to think about uh, in World War II, not so much in in uh, Civil War, or not at all in Civil War. <laughs> but, but you have all these elements of, there were ghost stories in the Pacific, there are ghost stories in Europe, there's ghost stories in the United States. There are not just ghosts of human beings, there's actually ghost objects. So very quickly, I thought that I wanted to kind of shape this as a more of a, a global approach to the supernatural. So, you know, I made sure that I had ghost stories about haunted ships. I had ghost stories about battlefields, uh, beaches, Normandy, Dieppe, all of those. I also have uh, ghost stories of, of uh, haunted planes and actually a phenomena I wasn't really uh, was sort of fascinated to to investigate was the idea of ghost planes where these planes themselves are are spirits. So that became part of the my overview of that era. But the other thing that I found fascinating and I'm finding more and more fascinating is just the Fortean elements, especially in war. So I was always interested in the occult aspect of, uh, you know, the Nazi party. So I decided I would do a section on looking at not just uh, the supernatural paranormal ghost stories, but also look at uh, the occult origins of some of these groups. So I, I kind of folded it into a supernatural overview of the history of World War II, sort of a, you know, a secret history of World War II. Wow, that's a lot of work. Um, now, I was going to say, so when, you, when you're doing something like this, it, it, there must be something different about the hauntings and the haunting sites than there would be on a standard haunting. Yeah, I, I would I would agree with that. Uh, some of the elements are are a bit different in haunted World War Two, for instance. It's very rare that you find a ghost story attached to, and there are exceptions to this, but in a regular ghost story, you might have the ghost of a king or 
you know, the ghost of Robert E. Lee uh, in, in the Civil War. But in, in Haunted World War II, what I found is that there, there are just ghosts of soldiers, ghosts of civilians. So it's hard to tie them to, you know, one individual or it, it's, it was more anonymous. And I, I guess that might go to just the sheer number of people that were involved uh, in the conflict. So that's that's probably one element that's a little different. Uh, and again, I would say that the seriousness of the material uh, is is much different. Those those wounds are still fresh, um, and I think that kind of shows in 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 the ghost lore and in the ghost stories. Do you find it as personal, and the stories to be as personal in a haunting of? let's say, a World War II site as compared to a university. Um, or, I mean, there must be a different yeah. type there. And I was just wondering if you were able to um, get as many personal details and follow through on something from World War as compared to a university. Well, in the university, you get a lot more ghost lore, which is just folklore that, features ghosts and spirits and this is this has become an oral tradition and the ghost stories in universities you know when I wrote that book and I, I walked away from it saying why do you know students tell ghost stories on campus when you're supposed to go to universities to lose superstition to become more rational and, and yet I think that uh, most of these campuses that I looked at and collected the folklore from were probably more haunted than some of the battlefields in World War II or in the Civil War on a you know per acre basis. So why does that happen? And I think that ghost stories play a lot of roles that you might not be aware of. Um, you know, in a university ghost story, there might be a, a victim of a homicide. And for the most part, Campuses are very uh, safe areas, and uh, I think probably before the Internet, uh, you would have these ghost stories about murders or suicides almost as a perpetual, permanent warning to students. So they become cautionary tales. And ghost stories also, and I think this would be, a, be similar to some of the ghost stories I looked at in World War II, in in that um, they serve as mini history lessons. If I tell you a ghost story about uh, at Penn State, we have the ghost of a mule, and you know the ghost. The mule was worked uh, on the fields and helped build the the first main building at Penn State. And I give you all those details. Within a very short time, I've given you a little bit of the essence of what that university stands for hardworking, blue-collar, agriculture, all of those are embedded in these ghost stories. And so when I tell you a, a ghost story about, you know, Normandy or, um, you know, a ghost story about the battlefields in Germany, I'm going to give you details that sort of give you a little bit of history about the battle, the people that were involved, the sacrifices, all of those are embedded in, in sometimes what we might consider all just a silly you know, piece of ghost lore. But I think they're really important that way. And I think they were more important prior to the Internet uh, because they were they would maintain that history. Now, I had some great history professors at Penn State. I had a minor in history, which somewhat explains getting into this book. And I have to tell you that ghost stories are not perfect or great history. But I, I found uh, through writing some of these books, one of the best comments I had about writing Haunted Rock and Roll was a lady basically accosted me at a, um, a book signing and said, I don't believe, you know, in any of this crap. But I will tell you, I, I love reading the history of these rock stars and I'm really getting into finding out more about them. So maybe that's what that serves as. So. It's almost like a jumping off point into getting deeper and deeper into into the history of those areas and those eras like World War II. What, what country did you find to be 
um, the most haunted as far as war sites or war locations? Well, I would say Normandy seemed to be the most. And I do have a distinction between a ghost story or an account of a ghost encounter and ghost lore. Um, ghost stories and ghost accounts of ghost encounters are personal, first person. They go to the Internet, they write their stories or they go to the press, they write them in books, they write them in newspapers. And there's a personal account. Ghost lore is sort of, well, this place is haunted because this happened. And I, my cousin's friend was driving there and saw, a, you know, a tank cross the road. Those are ghost lore. I still think they're important and I still include them in the books, but there's two different ones. But that's a kind of a long intro to saying that I think Normandy seems to be the most active, quote unquote, paranormally or supernaturally with a lot of people having very deep personal experiences at those places. In the United States, Pearl Harbor, a lot of people have personal encounters with that. But in my opinion, I think the, the deepest, the, the most riveting and some, somewhat gut-wrenching are the ghost stories in the South Pacific. Um, Iwo Jima is, is one that stands out. It's just a very... Uh, you know, gut wrenching story. And one of the stories that's, that's told, um, and I might be confusing this with, uh, there, it might be in Okinawa, but in those islands, there are, there are some really incredible stories about people feeling the presence of these civilians, um, who were, uh, in the, in the one case, the civilians were before the Japanese, or before the Americans landed on the island, the Japanese had basically told them that the Americans were going to come and they were going to kill and torture and rape and everyone was going to die in a most horrific fashion, probably thinking that the civilians would end up fighting against the Americans. But what happened was that groups of them uh, committed suicide uh, in mass, throwing themselves off the cliff and at that cliff, there's also a, a peace museum, and there have been several accounts of people walking in the field next to this peace museum, hearing these what sounds like footprints coming, uh, you know, a bunch of people running behind them. And when they turn, there's nobody there, but then they feel a wind and a presence go by them, and then they hear, you know, seconds later, the scream. Um, so that's a case for me that it was just you know, so moving to hear that story and, and to think about, you know, I don't know, I've never been able to find a personal account about that where someone said, I heard this, I saw this, but just that ghost lore around that era area and, and how that, you know, kind of feeds into this idea of uh, sacrifice and the real, the real terror of war. It, it speaks to that. So, when you when you're dealing with um, a ghost story from this situation, have you ha let's let's start this way? Have you mm -hmm. had an encounter at one of these locations that really affected you? Um, I don't want to say scared or made you happy, but just an effect, right the one that stayed with you to all this time. Well. And I, I do try to. I, I haven't visited all these sites. Uh, I never traveled to Europe, um, but some of the ones closer to home, like the USS North Carolina, which I was on. Now, I didn't see a ghost. I didn't hear one. But there is something, and this could be completely psychological on my part, uh, there is something about those spaces that you really feel the presence of those soldiers and sailors. Uh, so the USS North Carolina was one for me. I've always said that, you know, with my Haunted Rock and Roll book, when I went to Sun Studio, which I couldn't find any ghost stories about, believe it or not. But when I was in that space, I could, you know, I could feel the presence of Elvis. So for me, I didn't, you know, feel anything. I can't say that I, I sensed anything supernatural, but... I wonder whether that feeling doesn't play into either the experience that you have of maybe misinterpreting natural phenomena as supernatural, or could there be a possibility of a link between 
that that consciousness raising activity and what I would consider actual anomalous activity. Those are the questions I have. In my own personal life, I have a very high bar for paranormal and supernatural. And I've had what I would consider weird stuff happen to me that are that's very hard to explain. But I don't it's never risen to the level of of the supernatural. In this book and in other books, I can't say that it's even the majority, but what I can tell you is that people have experienced stuff that they can't explain and they they really believe that they have come in contact with uh, something outside of of what we would consider you know rational. And these people are believable. And trust me, at these book signings, I get everyone coming up and telling me they're the scariest stories they can think of uh, that, that has happened to them. And the people, by and large, are you know, smart. They don't seem to be prone to localized hallucinations that every time they walk into a certain part of the house, they have a hallucination that doesn't usually happen. Uh, all of those things make me open-minded uh, that, that these things could happen. Hmm. You know, I have to wonder. Um, so, did you talk to a lot of people that had families that were involved in some of these wars? You know, I really never got a chance to do that, but that's that's definitely an interesting idea. Yeah, it'd be interesting to to, to try and tie them together with some of the stories. Mm -hmm. How is it, how is the feeling of some of these places like? Um, do you think that the haunting will last forever, like in Pearl Harbor, for instance? I think Pearl Harbor definitely. I think as long as those that monuments there, as long as those sailors are really uh, buried uh, underwater in in what remains of the Arizona is this kind of. Uh, undersea tomb, I, I think there there will be. And again, I would say, one, I, I just feel, and that's another area that um, a lot of people just sense this overwhelming presence, an overwhelming feeling for those that were lost there. That I think that is is going to keep generating year after year and. A lot of it might be personal accounts of people who feel things or maybe in Pearl Harbor, there's a, a ghost story about a sailor who left the watch on the Arizona, uh, went on shore just minutes before the, the ship was attacked. And there's a story now that this you can at certain times see this ghostly figure draped in the mist looking out onto the Arizona Memorial. That, to me, feels like ghost lore, but it makes you wonder whether that might have started out as a, as a real encounter or someone's real uh, encounter with something that they misinterpreted. And so that it, it builds this, this almost like localized narrative in that, in that space that once you're in there, you're participating in, in one way or the other. And you go back home and you tell the stories to to folks and it gets all, all, you know, kind of merges together. Do you think, well, I mean, it's just a thought. Um, mm -hmm. Now, if you took someone, uh, if you could find someone that had never heard of World War II, mm. never knew it existed, and you took them to Pearl Harbor, do you think that they would pick up the same feelings that other people that knew about the history pick up? That's a real fascinating question. And my gut, my intuition would say yes, because I think there's something I think there's something real going on there. Uh, and I th I think they would pick up on it. Um, well, you do know, you think they'd pick up on, on, on like when you're in a place that there's been severe loss, casualties, <laughs> lots of death, and there's a lot of anguish and emotion that happened during that time? Do you think it's just resonant and, and, and just kind of taking a while to slowly lose its resonance in that area and that's what they'll pick up on? Or is it actual ghost interaction? I think it's, I, I lean more towards the resonance explanation. 
but I also leave open the possibility that it creates uh, phenomena outside of the normal type of phenomena. If if I'm interpreting some of these personal accounts correctly, and these people have had seen, felt, heard things that weren't there, then I think it might be a combination of both that the resonance of those stories externalizes into some of the phenomena that are, are talked about in those ghost accounts. If that makes any sense. Yeah. I'm just, I'm just trying to um, divide it all up and see where, you know, if there's any resolution. Um, mm -hmm. So in, in, in essence, um, do you, so well, I should have asked you this first. What was your feeling before doing something like this and your impressions of afterlife, ghosts, um, it, yeah. murder, and stuff like that? Where, where was your head before you got into any sort of research? That's a, that's a great question because, and, you know, my background was I looked at these stories more as entertainment. I looked at the university ghost stories almost exclusively as ghost lore. And pretty much my first few books were written in that way. And what happened to me was taking an open, honest, and I approached this as a journalist. So usually with these books, I take a, uh, a, a ghost account. Then I add some, maybe some voices of skeptics, even kicking in my own voices of skepticism. And then I maybe have a counter to it. That's almost like a, like an argument. I, I try to do that in almost all of the stories when it's, when it's applicable. Um, but what happened to me is, and, and when I'm writing these things, I shift myself between total believer and total, you know, cynic back and forth as I'm writing these. But, when I had people, after you write these things, then, then people give you their first person accounts and they always say, don't quote me on this or don't put me in your book, but here's what happened to me. So in my example, I, I wrote about the ghosts of Penn State. There's one building called Old Botany that's allegedly haunted and it's right across the street from the grave of George Atherton. So it has all the you know, I could be a consultant for universities to how to avoid ghost stories. And one of the things is don't put a grave on your campus. But this has created what I consider ghost lore. And then a few years after it was published, uh, a janitor came to me and actually sought me out and said, hey, I read your book and I read about old botany. Here's what happened to me. And his stories were were truly uh you know, I, I got a chill up and down my spine as he would tell me his stories. And and he wasn't worried about ghost lore or folklore. He actually petitioned to get off of cleaning that building at night because of some of the strange activity. Uh, he heard the one story he told me he was just finishing up vacuuming. And he heard this crash of glass and he thought someone broke in. So he within, you know, a minute ran down to that room, opened it up, and it was absolutely empty. There was no glass. There was nothing, you know, broken. It didn't seem anything amiss. There was no open windows. So he had, uh, you know, left and then told someone else, and they said that that place has, you know, got spooks. And then he looked at it, and that room, Old Botany, was, which is now a more of a office space, it was actually a lab. And he said that area was one of the laboratories that that where he experienced this. So I've moved more into what I consider open minded skepticism, where I really respect a person's experience. I'm not here to judge whether it was real or not. And, you know, my philosophy, I don't know whether I ever can. So my attitude has moved really almost, uh, you know, 180 degrees from where I was, where I considered this, you know, entertaining. And especially when I got into uh, haunted rock and roll, I, I really um, looked at, look at things completely different because in that case, I just think, I thought, well, yeah, big personalities and 
people are famous and they get attached to their stars and celebrities and they don't want them to die. So they keep them here through these ghost stories. That may be legitimate, but then you have other stories uh, among those uh, tales that, that seem to rise above that. And people, again, have told me about their own experiences in places like Graceland and uh, other areas where the, these rock, rock star ghosts have been seen or heard or felt. So it's, it's a very complex question, and uh, I do my best to, to straddle that fence. I was going to say, it sounds like in a way all of your books are con connected. It's almost like you're going through a process with the afterlife and haunting, and you're going through that process by writing these books. That's, that's, a, that's a fair point. Um, and I don't think anyone would read anything that I would write philosophically. I, I think I would probably bore people. So maybe it's a way for me to make it kind of entertaining, too. Mm. Now, um, did, have you ever thought about the reason that these ghosts actually haunt why do they exist? And that, especially like, you know, uh, war ones to rock ones to, mm -hmm. to uh, Penn State, to, uh, you know, there's there's all these variances of people. We all live lives. And, um, and it seems in general with Hollywood, um, we kind of get the idea that um, ghosts are people that had unfinished business on mm -hmm. life. Or they miss something, the, the mm -hmm. love of their life. or You know, there's always those stories, and they're the ones that kind of are out there for the most part. Mm -hmm. Do you think that's what's going on with ghost hauntings or ghost existence? Well, I think that's an explanation for some of them. My own personal opinion, though, is that this there's something much deeper to this than I think the traditional way that ghosts are looked at that is you know, your Uncle Henry passes away and he loved his chair so much and he loved his cigar so much that, uh, you know, his spirit or, you know, maybe remains of his consciousness exist in this space. And that's why you smell the cigar and that's why you might hear the chair creak. I think that's you think it's about the spirit. What I feel strongly is that these stories are more about the observer they're more about your consciousness than the consciousness of General Patton or the consciousness of Jim Morrison or, or any of the people that I've written about. It's more about what they are telling you. So rather than thinking that maybe, you know, your uncle is still here in his chair, maybe you're trying to preserve that memory in whatever way you can. That's kind of how I look at it. Uh, and I know I would get horrible uh, <laughs> debates from other people about that, but that, that's kind of how I look at it. Well, we get bad email for everything. Oh, good. It doesn't matter what side you're on. Okay. Um, but, well, I'm just sort of wondering this because a lot of times, um, and it's, it has progressed in the paranormal world, you know, with psychics and TV programs have moved on from not just the, the haunting you know, unresolved or these situations to now where you've got, you know, the, the psychic or the medium on going, well, she's trying to connect with you. She wants to tell you it's okay. Mm -hmm. like it's okay that you've stole her money and slept with her husband and, and killed their, yeah. their mother. Like, you know what I mean? And it's kind of like, right. uh, so they're here to tell you everything's great. There seems to be this resolution a lot with, with public and, I, I don't know that I'm really believing that, and I don't know if I really follow the direction everyone's going into in the mainstream. Uh, I'm just trying to, to, to try and figure out what the point would be, for because we live these lives, and then so they die. I'm going to be dead very soon. Um, mm -hmm. What would be the point of coming back for me to tell me it's okay when you're going to tell me that in a, in a couple of years? Right. I, I, I think that you've, you've kind of pinpointed the number one reason why I lean to the other direction. I, you know, I just, uh, first of all, I, I feel like it would be really unfair for somebody who was, uh, you know, let's say a victim of the Holocaust to be stuck in that, that place. So 
maybe I'm reacting to that. Uh, but I, I think also I, I, I feel like that explanation is a little too neat. Right. Uh, and I, I, I think there are some of the best ghost stories around are based on that. There's a ghost in this space and they need X, Y, and Z and I have to figure it out. It's a mystery. And then once you figure out they're here because, you know, there, there was a pair of glasses that they were missing and you have to bring it to so and so. And once you do that, the spirit is relieved. I feel like that, that's a, that's a, that's a narrative conceit in my, my, yeah. my, uh, opinion. So I, I don't think it's that neat. And the other thing I would suggest is this doesn't have to be an either or. It might be a both and. I, you know, I open up that possibility too. Uh, yeah, I'm, I, you know, and I'm, I'm not coming at it saying I really have an answer. I just, mm. I just analyze so much. That's how I'm built. Yeah, and, and I don't analyze to put down, and I'm not analyzing to disagree or same as with any side for the people listening. You know, they mm. they know me that by now. I hope. <laughs> uh, I just like to analyze what is put in front of me and, and think about it from all sides, and then, and I usually just leave it. I, I don't like to come up with an answer because then you're resolved and you no longer think about more things. You know what I'm That's, saying? Like once you've come up with a conclusion, then you no longer investigate. And I don't want to stop investigating. I right. just want to keep assembling ideas and information. Right. You know, and uh, I just find it, it ter terribly interesting. And that's the other thing. Now, do you find, um, do you think that a um, cemetery or a uh, war field or a hospital or someone's home, when each have had deaths or murders, uh, whatever occur, do you think there's a difference if, if you brought people from outside of that to each place to stand for a half hour? You think they would feel a difference between the four of them? That would be a fascinating study, but I, I, I don't know whether they would be able to detect the texture of those different spaces. Yeah. Yeah, there's so much to it, you know. Yeah. It's so much hard. Um, do you have any um, people in the um, paranormal world that impress you or that it fo that you follow that you sort of um check on just to see what they're doing because you think they're doing something good you know well i probably not so much in the the mainstream television uh paranormal world but but what i've done you know and i think you talked pretty close to my approach um kind of bring out all the voices you can and put them uh, put them in the story and let other people debate it and talk about it. I think that's what what makes what makes uh, writing about this so kind of rich and interesting. Uh, I also find it's it's probably why I get bad reviews a lot of times, but in any event <laughs> in, in, in any event that that is that is kind of my my approach but what I personally, I like to reach out to as many ghost hunters, paranormal investigators, paranormal researchers, mediums, interested people, whoever is can give me a little lead in this. And what I found is uh, most of those folks uh, are the ones that I've talked to really are are committed and legitimate uh, in their beliefs about about what they're doing and, and why they're doing it and have, you know, very deep, deep beliefs about it. So I've come a, away, you know, I think there's a, you know, out uh, for maybe the mainstream, they're kind of looked at a, as a little wacky, you know, it's, it, I've never been on a ghost hunt. I think the hours are, are terrible, <laughs> I, you know, but what I found is these people really, are committed to trying to find out the truth in whatever way they can. And and I respect that. I respect that from anybody. Yeah, I think it's good. I, I, like I said, I, I don't necessarily like or agree with the direction it seems to be going in. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's too, they have too many answers. Yeah, yeah. And, 
And really, what I would consider a lot of that to be is confirmation bias, where they go in and they investigate and they find this phenomena or things that are anomalous phenomena, and what they do is kind of carve it into their philosophy and narrative. I mean, you know, honestly, if I'm going to be completely honest, I don't see many people taking a very scientific approach to it. And that might be because you can't take a scientific approach, because there's no way you could quantify to a certain level, I felt a presence, you know. There's elements of this that maybe go beyond that. So that's, you know, that's another reason why I'm a little more open when I'm presenting these cases to get as many pieces out there so that people can decide for themselves. Because at the end of the day, they're going to anyways. Right. Yeah. That's how it goes. Yeah. Right. For sure. Now, are you going to continue writing these types of books? Well, I have one more that I'm going to put in. Uh, it's it's going to be on uh, a lot of the ghost lore and ghost stories surrounding the railroads and, and all over the world. So that will be next. And I haven't really made any decision on what I'm going to do. Uh, I don't know whether I can publish much more on the haunted, you know, ghost stories of music, but I'm I'm really attached to that project, and I think I'm going to try to pursue that, whether it's just blogging or, or you know, what I did last time was self-publish a book, because what I'm finding is, again, I, I will go on a show like this, and I will start getting emails about, oh, you know, so-and-so experienced this, have you checked this space out? And then I just start looking into it and collecting it. I've been, always been kind of a, a info hoarder since I was a reporter, so I'm always collecting these stories. And I'll probably just keep on, on putting it out there one way or the other. Yeah, well, you know, keeps you, keeps you moving forward. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, what, what's your other passions in life right now? Then? Uh, my other passions, I, I really love... Uh, Science and research writing, that's what I do full time. I'm, I'm interested in uh, future technology, uh, and I'm, I'm really interested in uh, religions, and especially Eastern religions. So I'm always uh, studying that and, and looking into that. Oh, touchy subject nowadays. Oh, well, <laughs> what, are, there, are there any non-touchy subjects anymore? <laughs> No, it seems to be that way, you know. Um, yeah, you have to be careful, you know, what goes mm-hmm. on in the world. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, that's that's really interesting. I find all this fascinating. Um, what was the scariest place you've ever been to? The scariest place I've ever been to? Or one that left um, the biggest impression. How's that? Well, the, the biggest impression I had was when I was in... Uh, Sun Studios, and, and really, in Memphis and Nashville, period, there's just something about that that space that uh, the, those spirits of those rock and roll pioneers were really alive for me when I was there. And when I was in uh, Sun Studio, they took me to a spot in the center of the studio, and then they started playing Johnny Cash. I think it was I Walked the Line playing on the speakers and the guide said this was the very spot that Johnny Cash stood uh, I'm getting goosebumps right now when he sang that song and it just you know I can I can relive it over and over again so the, that's I wasn't scared at all but I was just deeply deeply moved the thing about me I was born on Halloween and just about everything freaks me out so uh, I don't really try to go engage in any of the, the ghost stuff. I, I I like being in a safe spot uh, away from ghosts, writing about it so all my friends can enjoy that. Hmm. Safe spot. Now, did uh, Johnny Cash touch you inappropriately? No. Okay. <laughs> in no way. No. Oh. But I he did touch me. I would have been offended. I was like, what's wrong with me? <laughs> <laughs> Well, wow. well, that's yeah, that's pretty cool. Um, and, and so, have you ever seen a ghost? No, I 
uh, alluded to this earlier. I, I lived in an apartment for about a year, year and a half, and I had experiences where one night uh, I there were about three or four interior doors in this apartment. I left them open all the time. Uh, I went to bed and I realized I forgot to lock the door, and I think I threw out an expletive and said, oh, I don't care, and went to bed. I woke up the next morning, and every single door was closed, all four or five of those doors. So that was one thing. Uh, I was at the kitchen about 30, 40 feet from the television set. It turned on by itself. Uh, there, there were some of those types of phenomena. Now, I can explain how it might happen naturally. I might have slept, you know, been sleepwalking and got up and closed those doors as a response to, you know, that worry in, in myself. The apartment was in a house with three other apartments. I can't say that an infrared beam didn't ricochet across the, you know, the, the rooms or whatever. That That is entirely possible. So that could have happened. So I had a rational explanation for all of those. The the, the coda on, on this is that about 10 years after I had this experience, my friend was talking on Facebook about, oh, and I should say that I always had this feeling it was a female presence, and I don't know why I did that. I even told my wife, uh, who I was dating at the time when she was at my apartment, that she doesn't like you. And I don't know, maybe just to scare her, but uh, and it worked, but... Um, you know, I always felt that way, and, and my friend posted this saying something about, well, the, uh, the the lady visited last night. And so I, you know, messaged him, and I said, because he he's living in the apartment I lived in, and I said, what's going on? And he started sort of telling me the same type of phenomena without me, you know, ever talking to him about this. He basically had similar experiences to me. So... You know, that's uh, that's one of those those mysteries. And it also kind of goes into the face of what I've been saying is that, you know, it's really about the observer, not the space. But in this case, how does that space and those things preserve over time to two different people? You know, so I, I've had these experiences, which I, I find very difficult to explain through rational processes. But, at, you know, at the end of the day, I, I, I've never seen a ghost. No ghost has communicated with me. Um, so, so that's kind of where I'm at with that. Yeah, it's kind of one of those things. Uh, how do you decide? And, right. And, and, and as well, but, you know, if, if something did come along that was, um, seemed more realistic, you would probably, you would be open to it. Sure. Yeah. 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 I hope that day doesn't come, but yeah. yeah. Why does it scare you, or? Oh yeah, oh, oh. The, yeah. the idea just freaks me out. Oh, I mean, you got to confront a lot of stuff if that happens. Oh, that's cool. I mean, that's what life is: is confront and change. Yeah. yeah. You, you know, so but if you saw a psychic and the psychic started telling you all of these things about about you, mm -hmm. would that? How would that? Do you believe in that? Do you think that that's um, possible? Yeah, I'm open to it, and I'm open to it because of, of this one reason, is that, you know, as a science writer, there's still a lot that we don't know. In fact, there's more that we don't know than we know. And I think you have to be open that there could be alternative explanations for why that's happening, like mediumistic phenomena. There could be other reasons that we, we don't know, that we're not there. So I would remain open to it, and I'll tell you, uh, if if I did get that type of feedback that that was legitimate, you know, I'd be willing to to consider it. I mean, some of the th stories that I've heard from my friends who have visited mediums were are uh, to a level where you like my own experiences, uh, a level where you just have to be much more open minded about those encounters. You know, it, it could absolutely be complete coincidence, but to close your mind and just what I kind of don't like is ill-thought, superficial approaches to this phenomenon. So if, if you tell me you went to a medium and they said, you know, this, that, and the other thing, and that was all accurate, the, the standard skeptical uh, atom bomb is it was, oh, it's coincidence, right? Mm -hmm. So 
you know, a lot of our uh, studies that we do scientifically are based on things that basically say maybe it's a coincidence, but there's something going on. Let's find out what's going on. So that's kind of how I approach that. Well, I have the answer. Mm -hmm. You see, what it is is uh, Starbucks came along, and as more people started drinking more Starbucks, then they became more spiritually connected. I completely understand that. Yeah, I had Starbucks today. <laughs> there you go. And this is what's raising our level of awareness. Right. right. And so it, the more we have on the whole, and as it becomes on every single corner. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I have I have felt the presence of Elvis, and I have felt the presence of Starbucks. Uh, see, we've got it solved. There we go. No more problems. That's right. Yeah. Well, it's been a fun hour. I like this. Um, again, I, I, you have a website, right? MattSwain.com? Yeah, as egotistical as that sounds, I do. Yeah. And so uh, best for anybody to go there. We have your books and website linked up to ours. Cool. So people that are listening can just click on it and click and buy a book or or say, send a really bad email, click on mattswait.com and just right. do it, not, right. not on ours. Um, so, yeah, well, again, thank you very much, and um, um, I hope you come on again sometime. We do the rock and roll. I would love to talk about rock and roll. We'll probably need a couple hours, but I would like to add, if, if you can, uh, give me a review on, on Amazon.com uh, if you like the book. If you don't, uh, send me the email. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I ask for that all the time. I know people <laughs> don't realize. These reviews are important, people. So oh, my gosh. Yeah. Get on there and do it. I would appreciate it. To find out more about our show, guests, or to listen to past shows from our archive, please go to www.houseofmysteryradio.com. Show's over for now. Was it as good for you as it was for me? Well, good night. This has been a production of Something Weird Media. I'll be back.